All right, so welcome back, Physics 252. This is uh, the second, the next lecture in Chapter 26. We're going to pick up with um, Kirchhoff's rules. So uh, this is the last circuit that we looked at. Um, and what we did with this last circuit was, if you remember, we just sort of grouped uh, resistors into combinations, either series or parallel, right, uh, for forming an equivalent resistance. That is not going to work all the time. Okay, check this out. So, uh, some circuits, you look at these resistors and you say, okay, uh, clearly the 40 ohm and the 1 ohm resistor are in series, and clearly the 20 ohm and the 1 ohm resistor at the bottom are in series, right? Um, these two guys are in series. But, so once I combine, them, combine those, I'm kind of thinking, what do I do next? Well, uh, is the 41 together, is that in? series with 30 well we got some current but it's not the same current remember to be in the series it's got to be the same current okay well is it in parallel no it's not in parallel because remember to be in parallel the voltage across the two have to be the same so that's not the case that's I, neither of those is the case for the 41 and the 30 so they are neither in series or in parallel because this of this 45 volt battery same thing down here the 21 together it's neither in series nor in parallel with either of these two branches. So uh, that's kind of a difficulty. What do we do about that? Well, uh, we uh, in, in every situation, kind of like I've been trying to, to sort of train you to think, every situation of circuits comes down to two rules, charge conservation and energy conservation. Those things always have to be true. So uh, we just label those two ideas or principles with new names, um, and then those two names together become Kirchhoff's rules. But it's really just charge conservation and uh, energy conservation. So charge conservation says the sum of currents entering a junction must equal the sum of currents leaving it. Because current is charge flowing per unit time, if you've got a certain amount of charge flowing into a junction per unit time, then that must be accounted for in terms of charge flowing out of that junction per unit time. So. Um, in this case, I3 is depicted as flowing in from right to left into point A, junction A, and then currents I1 and I2 are depicted as flowing out of it. Now, how do we know that currents flow in that direction? Okay, uh, you, you see down here at the bottom this 80 volt battery, that uh, could very well push I current from right to left back across the 30 ohm battery. How do we know that? It could happen. So uh, here, when we use the junction rule, any junction in the circuit we just guess. We just say, okay, let's guess that I3 is going in from right to left into junction A. I1 and I2 are going out. Uh, if we guessed wrong, then the, one of those currents, one or more of those currents will turn out to be negative. And that negative sign just tells us we guessed the wrong direction. Not a problem, okay? Um, because, right, the flow of negative current out of a junction is equal to the flow of positive current into the junction. So, um, all right, that's, that's the first Kirchhoff rule called the junction rule. Uh, the second rule is the loop rule. It says the sum of the changes in potential or voltage around a closed loop need to be zero. Look at this circuit up here, right? So, uh, going, if you start from point D here, for whatever reason that the graph they start at point D, uh, and you're, if you are a charge, a positive charge, you get positive voltage, so positive boost in energy per unit charge going from D to E. There you go. You, got, you plot that change in voltage or energy per unit charge. Then you go through a 400 ohm resistor, right, going from point A to E to A actually, right, um, we are, when we draw circuits, we're conceptually idealizing all the resistance of the wires and everything else uh, as being bundled into one of the two resistors, okay? So we're using idealized conducting paths with, which have zero resistance, uh, in which case there's no loss in uh, potential going from E to A. Then as I drop across, as, my, as I'm a charge and I move through the 400 ohm resistor, I lose energy per unit charge to do that. It costs me energy to push through a resistor to get to point B, and then it costs me some more energy to get from B to C. Now, the amount of, that, of voltage that it costs me depends on the actual resistance of the resistor, obviously. V equals IR. So, um, so then we get back you know, from, from point C. We get, uh, keep losing my mouse here, we get from point C to point D. 
Again, idealized uh, conductors do not lose any voltage, and so that's um, no loss in voltage. And now we, at point D, we have to be back to where we started. So uh, if we start at zero on this graph, we've got to get up, at, end up at zero. That's the, the loop law. Okay, again, energy conservation just says, as I go around the loop, ener any energy gained or lost, any of it, has to be accounted for. And if, if I'm a charge, the only way to lose energy is to push through the resistance, okay? Um, if we, when we want to fold in a capacitor, if, if we've got a capacitor, well, charges aren't actually traveling across the capacitor, but there is a voltage drop across the capacitor. And as in, you can say, if I uh, did jump across these plates, I would lose this much voltage, right? Um, okay, so that's, that's all we do. Um, I'm going to, uh, I mean, this is a good sort of review, a good sort of problem solving set of steps you can use. Uh, I'm going to do this problem in a separate video. So this example, um, it's a big example. It's obviously worked out in the book. You can follow through if you want to, but um, I'm going to do this in a separate video just because it's a big and important problem. All right. So uh, these loop laws allow us to analyze lots of different circuits. There's actually a homework problem uh, home that I might look at as a, in a separate video as well um, that it's sort of a network of resistors and the problem is uh, ask you what's the equivalent resistance of the network and then you, if you look at it you realize, oh, I can't really um, combine these resistors into a single either I can't reduce this network into sets of series and parallels. So you have to, you, it seems like you have to apply Kirchhoff's loop laws there. Well, there's actually a trick using the symmetry of the, the circuit for that problem. Um, and like I said, I might, I might take a look at that in the video, separate video. Okay, so uh, for all of these examples, again, just using uh, the loop laws, um, you know, drawing loops around circuits and loops within circuits uh, allows you to, to analyze anything. I mean, even in advanced electrical engineering, loop law is where is your starting point. Now, obviously, we've, you know, things get a bit more complicated, and this is where they get more complicated, right? What if you've got a capacitor? Okay, you close the switch, the circuit, you know, you know zoomed in version, close the switch, circuit begins to charge, okay? Um, does that happen instantaneously? Well, we don't know. I mean, we've kind of assumed that if you charge it, we haven't really asked the question, how long does it take uh, to charge a capacitor if you charge a capacitor? And now that we've got a resistor, we ask the question, well, how does the resistor affect uh, the charging process of the capacitor? So, um, the, the, Solution to that is a differential equation. I did a separate video to walk you through this to get you from uh, just simply applying the loop law of the circuit to this final solution. Okay, check that video out. It's a separate video. I didn't put it in here because it's again, it's a lot of math. It's a solving a differential equation, um, and I want to separate the math from the concepts because conceptually, I want to take one step back and say, okay. For an RC circuit, what, what we really want to take away from this is that it takes time to charge up an RC circuit. The equation is an, uh, is an exponential, right? One minus e to the negative t over RC. And if you look at that, we know that you know, as an exponential, uh, that asymptotically approaches zero, right? Uh-oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the, uh, <laughs> the function e to the negative t over rc asymptotically approaches zero. So this asymptotically, this function together asymptotically approaches the value ce, which in e is just the voltage of the battery, so it asymptotically approaches cv, q equals cv. So what's happening here is that because the resistor, or any resistance in the circuit, charging takes time, uh, and the rate at which it charges is something that we can calculate by solving the differential equation. But uh, Strictly speaking, because of the resistance, it never gets to fully charge, 100%, right? I mean, it gets with it to within a millionth of a millionth of a millionth very fast, but um, of a fully charged, okay? So 
uh, that this is the voltage across the capacitor with respect to time and V Q equals C V. So the voltage across the capacitor is proportional to the charge across the capacitor. Uh, the current through the resistor, okay, if we have this and we realize in my derivation you can connect the charge across the capacitor, or the, the rate at which the charge is changing on the capacitor to the current through the resistor, it's just the derivative. Uh, the derivative of this top is the bottom, okay? The derivative of this function is if you just take dqdt down there at the bottom, um, it's CE uh, times negative. 1 over RC times e to the negative t, or, uh, right, go back, <laughs> um, the c's cancel, so it's just, um, take the derivative, you have uh, e over r, right, times e to the negative t over rc. Okay, so again, check out those videos to, uh, to see how you get the, the equation, but Notice, now that we have kind of a conceptual sense of, ah, okay, so uh, it takes time for the capacitor to charge. Once the capacitor is fully charged, that means no more charge is traveling onto the capacitor plates, okay? Uh, and if no more charge is traveling onto the capacitor plates, that me must mean the current conceptually must mean that the current has stopped flowing because if it were flowing, then the charge would be accumulating on the capacitor plates or it would be changing somehow, okay? so. As the rate of change of charge on the capacitor plates uh, approaches zero, right, the current, which is the rate of change of charge to the circuit, approaches zero. That makes sense conceptually. Okay, uh, so this this combination of values R C, uh, that's called the time constant. Notice as this as this value R as this product R times C resistance times capacitance goes up. Since that's on the bottom of the exponent of this E, okay, then that means that it takes longer to get to a certain uh, integer exponent. Let's say negative one, right? If we're if we're waiting until it takes, if we want to know how long it takes to get to e to the negative one, or one minus e to the negative one of the full voltage. Uh, then that constant RC determines that. The larger that RC is, the longer T has to, to become, or larger T has to become, to get make that ratio equal to 1 for that particular value. So uh, what that tells us conceptually is that, you know, as you might expect, intuitively that kind of makes sense. As R goes up, the resistance goes up, it takes longer to charge, okay, the capacitor. What about C? Well, C, like I said, is from Q equals CV. C is just the ratio of charge to voltage, uh, which means as C goes up, that means you're, for a given amount of voltage, you're going to be able to store more charge, and that will take longer, right? Um, so both of those should conceptually make sense. Resistance increases how long it takes to charge a capacitor because it resists, right? Slows the, the flow of current. Um, and then capacitance increases how long it takes to get full charge because it increases the amount of full charge, right? The value of, of fully charged increases if you increase the capacitance. Okay, so uh, again, just work through this example. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward example. You can work through, check that out in the book, um, plug and chug. If you have any questions about that, definitely let me know. But uh, discharging capacitor. Okay, so a discharging capacitor works very similar. Notice that in this circuit, we don't see a battery because we took out the battery. Um, so you close the switch and a fully charged capacitor which sets the initial voltage will just discharge through the resistor. What does that mean? It means all these charges that it took energy to put onto this capacitor plate will spend that energy by pushing their way through the resistor and finding the negative plate. Okay. Um, so again, you can do a similar, I, I think this is a great place to practice uh, the derivation. If you write a loop law for this, okay, if we want to find this equation, if we want to derive this equation, write a loop law. Solve, it's a simpler loop law because the battery is not in the picture. Solve that equation exactly the same way we did in the derivation for the charging circuit and you will find this. that. Uh, to no surprise, the uh, charge across the capacitor plates exponentially decreases down to zero, and the 
RC value, the R time constant, determines how long it takes. Again, if it has, if you charge up a capacitor and then connect to a very high resistance resistor, then that the resistance of the resistor will slow down the discharging process, right? Um, whereas, again, the larger, more the capacitance is, the more charge has been stored, and then the longer it takes to discharge that. So, um, so both of those should make sense. Conceptually, you know, focus in the, on the concept. I like to ask conceptual questions about charging, discharging RC circuits, okay? Um, so this is you know, a good example of a fully charged up and then you take this switch and you put it into position B and now that's a discharging circuit. Uh, if we were doing labs, that, that would, uh, ex this is exactly what we do in our lab, is we put a discharging circuit together and then um, measure how long it takes to get to different fractions of the total ch uh, voltage or charge and you know, use the equation that we derived as predictions and check, check how well those predictions work out, and they work out pretty well. All right, um, so uh, lots, 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 lots of applications for RC circuits, but the, the most ubiquitous, you know, most widespread application of a resistor capacitor network also involves something called an, an inductor, so more on that to come. Uh, in the electromagnetic induction chapter, we're going to pull one final piece into this puzzle uh, called an inductor, and then with the resistor capacitor inductor circuit, that is how we transmit information uh, through cell phone, through Wi-Fi, anything. So an RLC circuit, we're putting the R and the C together, we need the L, but an RLC circuit, L stands for inductor, is the basis of our modern civilization, um, pure and simple in terms of information, right, the age of information. Okay, so uh, this last section is just electrical hazards. It's useful to know, you know, the idea that if you break a circuit, you're kind of, if the circuit in a microwave is broken and you touch the microwave, uh, then you're completing the circuit with the ground. That's why we have grounding plugs in these things because part of anything that has a third prong, that center at the you know, bottom, uh, that's a grounding plug. And you know that means that some part of the device is grounded, like usually the any parts that you could touch, right? <laughs> any parts that are contact uh, are grounded so that the, you don't form a ground circuit and pull charge through that if there's a short in the machine. Um, wiring and household wiring, okay. Uh, generally, it's kind of complicated. <laughs> uh, so, but the basic idea is that there's a neutral wire and then a black or hot wire. Um, sometimes there are two uh, hot wires in a, a single neutral one, um, but the neutral remains the kind of the ground, the, and then the power from the power company. Uh, basically, the power company alternates the voltage of this black wire from 120 volts to negative 120 volts, okay? And then they alternate the voltage of this wire um, inversely, like when this is positive 120, this is negative 120. Okay, um, not really going to test you on that. I mean, it's just this stuff. Electrical hazards is all really for your information. It's just you know applications of what we're learning. So, uh, and then ammeters and voltmeters, because we haven't done any labs, um, these these are important facts about how to measure current and how to measure voltage, but. Uh, for right now, <laughs> we're going to skip them. All right. Okay, so that's the end of this uh, chapter. So you don't need, don't need to worry about ammeters and voltmeters. Uh, end of this chapter. Like I said, on a separate video, I'm going to I'm going to record the derivation of the um, differential equation or the equation for charge. Let's see. Let's pull it up here. Doesn't have it here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll go back. So this, I record a separate video to derive, derive that. Um, do I need you to know that? I do want you to be aware of how to write, the, write down the loop law and how to relate current and charge. But I, you know, because differential equations is not really a prerequisite for this course, I generally don't have people solving differential equations in the, you know, in the test. So uh, you don't really need to worry about that. Um, all right, we'll see you in the next video.